If you take a bone from the past and you touch that bone, you leave more DNA on that bone than is in that bone, right? So you contaminate the sample. If I then extract DNA from that ancient bone, how can I say that that is the DNA of that bone and not of the archaeologist or the lab person or someone that came in contact with that bone? And that has been a very big problem. Since the very early days, people have discussed how can we actually make sure that the DNA that we study from those bones really comes from those bones. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm not the speaker, Johannes Krause, who just entered after, I would say, a truly epic migration today through Germany. He arrived here on the minute. Uh, my name is Leon Klaassens, and I'm very happy that I get to spend just very, very few minutes uh, introducing this evening's lecture and also the fact, as you can see above me, that we have a very uh, special occasion, right? This lecture that Johannes is giving today is in memory of uh, Professor Joop Gerards, who almost a year ago, uh, unfortunately, passed away as anybody, right? You pass away too soon, usually. Um, and um, this lecture is co-organized by a whole series of different uh, entities. Of course, we're here in the Studium Generale uh, program. And in the Studium Generale program, the uh, Eugène Dubois Foundation, of which Joop was the chairman, he was one of the founding members, he was the first chairman, and uh, he was the chairman up until about a year ago. Um, they would always organize together with Jaap Janssen and the other staff from the Studium Generale a special lecture. Uh, the Eugène Dubois Foundation is a foundation that tries to elevate and tries to uh, make more people aware of a very famous scientist who a long time ago, more than a century ago, was born in Eisden, that's Eugène Dubois. And Eugène Dubois was a very famous scientist of many different interests and capabilities. And he was the person who found in Indonesia what was called as Java Man, which is a homo erectus. So Joop, as a founding member of this, uh, this society, the Eugène uh, Dubois Foundation, um, was very involved, of course, uh, in promoting uh, this, right, this, this, this knowledge. And uh, there are so many people in the audience who knew Joop so well that they know that Joop was involved in so many different things. He was a professor uh, at Maastricht University from 1982 onwards. Um, he is responsible for, uh, right, together with other colleagues, but establishing the Department of Clinical Genetics. Uh, he was a member of uh, the Null University, I don't know if we have any members of that too, which is a carnivalesque entity, right? The Zero University, if you translate this. Um, you've had so many different passions, I think, in science um, that um, uh, he would be thrilled, I know, to have Johannes here. Uh, it's important to note that Johannes actually is somebody who Joop tried to have come to Maastricht uh, for Dubois activities for many, many years now. Um, and um, unfortunately, right, this occasion um, happens to be it, but I know that Joop is probably smiling knowing that we have Johannes here. Um, and... Um, um, it's, uh, right, I think, I think it's nice that we can do something in Joop's memory. 
Um, we also have family of Yoop in the audience. So I just want to highlight how diverse the group of people is who are here. That also includes students in my class. So I know that you're here. Thank you very much. I also know who's not here. And I'll see you all at 8.30 a.m. for a lecture. It will be fantastic. But we're going to have a fantastic lecture um, coming up now. Um, this is great, right? Uh, we get the next slide here, and this is to introduce Johannes. Uh, Johannes is a director of the Max Planck Institute of Evolutionary Anthropology, if I say it correctly, which is in Leipzig. Uh, Johannes is a tremendously famous scientist who, uh, I don't know how many papers you publish in Nature a month, Johannes, but sometimes that's what it feels like to me, right? He's an expert in archaeogenetics, paleogenetics. Uh, he's uh, worked on the Neanderthal genome. He's worked on so many things that I really shouldn't try to do a disservice in doing a short summary, but that, in fact, I should yield the floor as quickly as I can so we can all go listen to Johannes. Johannes, thank you so much for making this long trek out here, and we look forward to your lecture. Let's start. Yes, indeed. It's been an epic migration <laughs> to come here. Um, only took me about 12 hours to get here. Um, but yeah, I took a very wrong train at some point in the wrong direction. And only when I, uh, the train conductor actually kicked me out of the train and said, we are there. And I was like, that's not Maastricht. And he was like, nope, <laughs> that's in the other direction. So I had gone like way beyond Nijmegen. But um, anyway, I took a taxi from there here. Um, and I managed to come. Um, and I want to say it's actually a great honor to be here, and it's been more than 10 years that I've been here before, and uh, it's a kind of sad occasion to actually be here. I mean, I'm honored certainly to give the uh, Eugène Dubois lecture, but it's also very sad that uh, Jupp is not with us uh, tonight. Um, he had indeed invited me a couple of times over the last two years to come. Um, and I couldn't come, I got a child, that was also a pandemic you might have heard about, um, so there were some reasons why I couldn't come and it was very sad for me then to learn er earlier this year that he actually uh, passed away so this is uh, very very sad he was a tremendously amazing person I think many of you probably met him and he was super friendly he had invited me 10 years ago to one of his um, uh, retreats that probably many of you might have also participated in um, and he was a fantastic host. He took me out here in Maastricht uh, to pubs. Um, he had a great time. He even took me out to a football game. Um, it was actually the first football game of my life, <laughs> surprisingly. I had never been to a large, big football game, except of my village football games, um, which is probably also because Leipzig doesn't or didn't have back then a football team. So we didn't have one for a very long time. But now we have one, and now I go almost every week to football. So I think I got actually inspired by Jupp uh, to do that. Um, and uh, as you've just heard, uh, Jupp has not just been a great geneticist and did fantastic pioneering work on pre-implantation diagnostics, for example. Um, he was also very interested in human evolution. And when he retired, he then became the chair of the Eugène Dubois Foundation. Um, that is quite uh, interested then in kind of trying to look into human evolution and also make Eugène Dubois, I guess, more um, known to people. And uh, what you also told me is that he lived, in fact, very close to the house where uh, Eugène Dubois was born, just a few hundred meters away from there. Um, and that's really interesting to me because I grew up in a small village in Thuringia where just a few hundred meters away from my hometown was a house where the person was born that discovered the Neanderthals. Um, and little did I know when I was growing up there that one day I will discover my own hominin, the, the Denisovans. So we have basically three discovery uh, people <laughs> somehow to thank for this, um, what I will talk about tonight. So, uh, and there's been amazing coincidence that Basically, I was from that same village and then discovering Denisovans, where the person was also born and discovered Neanderthals. And now I'm here to kind of celebrate the person that discovered Homo erectus. So um, it's um, quite uh, amazing. 
Yeah, so um, then again, uh, as we've just heard, Jupp would have probably enjoyed very much uh, to hear more about kind of what we're doing now these days in human evolution, archaeogenetics, paleogenetics, whatever you want to call it. And it's really sad again that he didn't have the opportunity to this, um, but hopefully um, he can smile down from wherever he is tonight. So I want to talk tonight about some of the research that we have been doing over the last um, about decade, I would say, probably the, since the last time I've been here, in fact, to give a lecture on human evolution. And I want to focus a bit tonight on the genetic history of Europe. So I want to not try to tell the whole history of the world and all people on the planet, but more on kind of the European population. Um, but of course, keep in mind that similar stories can be told for any other place in the world, but you will soon see why I focus on Europe, because this is just the place where we have most of the data from currently. Um, and all that we do these days in genomics is very much influenced by technology. Um, and that's maybe something that you are aware of or not, but the technology that allows us to study genes, which we call gene sequencing, sequencing machines, has tremendously changed over the last uh, about 20 years or so. So when I was a student at university, um, this was the machine that we had in the lab. Um, we had a machine that was called ABI sequencer, and it could produce about 100 DNA sequences per day. And that was really the best machine. At that time, it took years to sequence the human genome. In fact, the first human genome took almost 10 years to be decoded, and it cost billions of euros. Now today, we have a machine that looks like that, so similar, a bit like a mixture between a washing machine and an iPad, but the machine that we have now can sequence per day 20 billion DNA sequences. So the throughput of that machine has increased by 100 million fold in just 15 years, which is incredible, right? Computers increase in their power every year, but not compared to this type of technologies. And that has catapulted us somehow into almost like a, uh, if you want, the age of the genome, some people even call it, because DNA sequencing has become a standard technique. There are millions of people in the world that have their genomes analyzed. You can study the genomes of even unborn children just from the DNA that circulates in the blood of the mother. You can now even change genetic positions um, using, for example, CRISPR-Cas or other technologies. So it's really a revolution that is happening right now, which has probably a lot of consequences also for medical genetics in the future. And you and other people have been very much on the forefront and pioneers in those uh, early techniques. But what I'm using this technology for is not necessarily to treat people or help people with their medical conditions, but to learn more about human evolution and what we call genetic history, so the history of the human population. So how did they end up where they are today and how they are related among each other? And traditionally, this type of work has been done by paleoanthropologists like, for example, Eugène uh, Dubois that were studying fossils like Java men, for example, that were discovered over the last 150 years uh, all over the world. And they tried to make sense out of those fossils, trying to somehow connect them, trying to see what is our ancestor, what is maybe an extinct lineage of human, and then coming up with some sort of pedigree that often looked like that, where you have basically some um, humans from the past and try to connect them. And sometimes there's more like a dotted line because it's a bit unclear and sometimes it's more clear that one is an ancestor and one might be an extinct um, lineage. But as you can imagine, the fossil record is quite fragmentary. There's a lot of fossils missing, so it has been very difficult. And if you talk to anthropologists, I think there's more such trees than, in fact, anthropologists in the world. Every anthropologist has a different idea how humans evolved. And sometimes you read about four species that lived in the last million years. Sometimes you read about 25 species of humans that lived in the last million years. So there's many different opinions. And it's kind of difficult to just do that based on the shape of those skulls, for example. And this is, I think, where DNA can actually be quite helpful because DNA is a bit like a time machine because it preserves well over time. So the 
oldest genomes that have been studied so far are more than a million years old. So we can really go back in time, study the DNA of, for example, ancient humans, and then just see how those humans are, for example, related to other humans that lived later, or, for example, that live today. And this is, with a, this is done with a field that we call paleogenetics or archaeogenetics. So the difference is that paleogenetics usually looks at um, animals or also at hominins that are not necessarily modern humans, but archaeogenetics is everything that is associated to modern humans or to homo sapiens, so that can be human bones, that can be also animals, domestic animals, or things like that. So this is where the difference is in archaeogenetics and paleogenetics. And that really is some sort of time machine for us because it does allow us to go like archaeology back in time, look how basically the genetic makeup of populations was in the past. So how do we do that? We just take fossils, like human skulls, for example, or teeth that we have from the past. We then have specific labs that we call clean rooms, where we extract the DNA from those ancient bones by drilling in little holes. Then you get bone powder. So this bone powder is then dissolved so that the DNA is released. And then the DNA gets put in those machines here that can then sequence and basically read the DNA from the past millions or billions of DNA sequences and then in the computer you basically then assemble the genomes from the past that you can then study. And as I said before, this allows us to go far back in time. When I was a child, I was dreaming of going even yet further back in time, which probably many of you might have shared back in the day. There was this exciting Steven Spielberg movie, uh, Jurassic Park, that probably many of you have seen, where the idea was that you can maybe even then study the DNA of dinosaurs from, from um, amber, which unfortunately it turned out to be just science fiction, unfortunately, I have to say. Um, but still, like I said before, we can go back millions of years, so about 1.6 million years is the oldest genome that has been studied so far, in this case actually from a mammoth, so from an old tooth that is um, more than 1.5 million years old, and it was in fact in permafrost, so it was found in Alaska, so it was frozen for a very long time and therefore well preserved, unlike dinosaur uh, bones or even then mosquitoes or something in amber, they're of course not frozen and it actually turns out that amber is not a good material to preserve DNA to start with. So DNA actually degrades really fast in amber, so you can't really uh, do that, what was described in Jurassic Park. So then using this ancient DNA as well as the DNA from people that live um, in the world today, like yourself, for example, and of course also archaeology and anthropology, we have now a pretty good understanding of the evolution of humans, so the history of our own species, Homo sapiens, how did we evolve over the last uh, few hundred thousand years. So we now know that modern humans um, actually evolved in Africa, so this is where basically we, we evolved from some ancestor. Um, and then all people that live in the world today have a common ancestor that lived some about 200,000 years ago in Africa. We're not quite sure where in Africa, it could be in the east or in the south of Africa, but somewhere there um, this ancestor of modern humans lived. And then about 50,000 years ago, then the ancestors of the people that live in Europe and Asia today left Africa and then moved to Europe, Asia, East Asia, and Australia. And about 15 to 25,000 years ago then into the Americas. But when humans left Africa about 50,000 years ago and came to Europe and Asia, they were actually not alone because there were already people living in Europe and Asia at the time. So in Europe, you had Neanderthals that probably all of you have heard about. They lived here from about 500,000 years ago until then about 39 to 40,000 years ago when they then disappear. So the moment almost when modern humans come to Europe, they actually disappear. And there's many theories why they disappeared. Um, some people say they didn't disappear, they live in us. Some people say we wiped them out. Um, some people say there was a big volcano that erupted. Maybe it's one of them, maybe it's all of them. We're not quite sure, but anyway, about 40,000 years ago, they disappear. Um, and then there were also other hominins in the world at the time, so there were not just Neanderthals, in Europe, there were also um, some form of Homo erectus or Denisovans living in 
Asia, so Central Asia and Eastern Asia. So Homo erectus, of course, famous you know, since at least Eugène Dubois, who discovered Java man. Um, so those were those early humans like Peking man that lived in Asia from probably about 1.5 million years onwards. But it has been quite debated over the last, say, 15 years or so, if Homo erectus was still around when modern humans came to Asia. So there were some fossils that dated to about 50,000 years ago where people said that must be Homo erectus, but now they are redated to be more 200,000 years ago. So currently a lot of anthropologists think that Homo erectus was extinct when modern humans came to Asia. But there were people living in Asia and that were not Homo erectus, but that were in fact Denisovans. So Denisovans now are this new form of human. I mentioned them before. I was lucky enough to discover them some more than 10 years ago, but I didn't discover them like um, then Dubois, who went on a fantastic expedition somewhere uh, to Java. Uh, I actually discovered them in Leipzig in the lab. So kind of boring, um, but it was a molecular discovery. So I got some bones from Siberia that I got sent in an envelope, in fact, um, and I extracted the DNA from that bone and it turned out to not be the DNA of a Neanderthal, which we already knew back then how it should look like. It was also not the DNA of a modern human, which we also know well how the different humans in the world look like. It was actually the DNA of a new human that we could then call, give it a name, could have called it Homo, I don't know, Krausensis or something. <laughs> but we in fact decided to call it Denisovans, like Neanderthals, based on the place where they were discovered. Um, so Denisova is actually a cave where the um, bone was discovered and uh, we decided to not give it a Latin name like Homo Denisovan, Denisovensis maybe or Altaiensis or something um, and the main reason why we decided to not give it a, a species name like a Latin name was that um, my doctor father so Svante Pebo and myself we were very much uh, the opinion back in the day that one shouldn't um, necessarily give those type of names because you make a statement. If you name something Homo something, like Homo erectus, you call it a species and you basically make a statement that this form of human can not hybridize or cannot have offspring with another type of human like Homo sapiens, for example. Uh, the same would be true for Homo neanderthalensis that at some point in the 19th century was called like that, um, basically calling it a different species. However, without having, for example, genetic data, it's really hard to show um, who had uh, offspring with whom in the past. Um, and even if some forms of humans have offspring with each other, um, it doesn't necessarily mean they're not different species, um, as you will see in a minute. So uh, we basically decided to avoid the whole discussion and just give it the name Denisovan. And that's basically also the name that stuck. So that's how most people in the world now call Denisovans. And they are like Neanderthals, they lived in Asia from about 400 to 500,000 years ago. They are in fact a sister species or sister group to Neanderthals. So they share a common ancestor and they separated from humans, this common ancestor, maybe about 600,000 years ago. So they're closer related Neanderthals and Denisovans compared to modern humans. But in fact, those three types of humans are not the only ones that lived in this 50 to 100,000 year time window, there were also this tiny little humans that lived on the island of Flores um, that are now called Homo floresiensis. They were discovered about 20 years ago in a cave on Flores, so an Indonesian island. And they were found in the year when Lord of the Rings was in the cinema. Um, those people were quite small. They were only about a meter tall. They had rather big feet. So they're called hobbits also. So if you ever read about hominins um, that are called hobbits, then people talk about Homo floresiensis. And Homo floresiensis is a very, very special human. Um, it was small, as I said, but what's so, so striking about it is that it has a tiny brain. So the brain is the size of the brain of a chimpanzee. So it has a really, really small brain, um, which is very unusual. Um, they also lived on that island, which probably gave them that what's called island dwarfism, so they became really small. And it's a very special place. If you ever have the chance to visit this island, I, I was really fascinated. I had the chance to go there and see the cave and talk to the people. 
Um, one of the first interests I had was, what was Homo floresiensis eating? I don't know if you know what Homo floresiensis' main food might have been. Any guess? Was in fact rats. They were eating rats. I was like, okay, rats, small little rats. It's like, no, not small little rats, giant rats. They were eating rats that were one meter tall, so we sized, really, really big rats. And then my first question was like, so when did they get extinct? And they're like, what do you mean extinct? And then the guy actually went behind the house and got one that they just had killed the same day. And it was like a beaver, like really, like a rat the size of a beaver. So that didn't go extinct. Homo floresiensis did. Um, and then what, what else was on that island, which I didn't know because I always put it to a different island, was the Komodo dragon. Komodo dragons also live on that island. They live on several of those islands. One is Komodo, but they also live on Flores. And I was like, wow, so what were Komodo dragons actually eating? Because I know from TV documentaries that today they're eating buffaloes, right? Uh, which is incredible, a lizard eating a buffalo. But it's even weirder because back in the day when Homo floresiensis was living, there were no buffaloes on that island because buffaloes were brought there by humans. So what are they eating? They were in fact eating elephants, right? So a lizard eating an elephant, but they were dwarf elephants, so they were only like a meter tall. Um, and then they had giant storks that were like big birds, three and a half meters, and it was really a magical place, so kind of yeah, Tolkien-like uh, actually place. Um, so uh, again, you should check it out if you have the chance to go there. And for Homo floresiensis, it's pretty much also unclear what it actually is and how it is related to us, because it's so weird that people have discussed it many times and people have not really found a good solution. Some people thought it could be a pathology, that it was some sort of um, uh, kind of pathology, some uh, genetic condition, like microcephaly, for example. Um, other people said it's a very, very early hominin, something like an Australopithecus, so like millions of years diverged from humans. Um, again, there has been many debates. Currently, quite a lot of us are thinking that maybe they're just Denisovans, like a tiny version of the Denisovan, because they had similar big teeth, like other Denisovans have been found with big teeth, but really we don't know what they are. And so we are back to this problem that I just explained earlier when we don't have genetic data, when we just look at the morphology, it's sometimes hard to know how those hominins are related to each other. And this is where we were quite lucky then some years ago, um, together with Svante, um, my, my PhD advisor, um, we then uh, went out to study the genomes of those uh, archaic humans. So with these techniques that I explained earlier, we studied the genome of the Neanderthals as well as the Denisovans. And we could then actually see how those hominins are related to the people that live in the world today. And first we did that for Neanderthals about 10 years ago. We published the first Neanderthal genome. And what we found was that Neanderthals are not our ancestors. So that was the first kind of discovery that they're really not just the ancestors of modern day Europeans, but Europeans do share some of their ancestry with Neanderthals. So we have about 98% of our ancestry coming from Africa, from those people that left Africa 50,000 years ago. But we also have 2% that come from Neanderthals. But to our surprise, what we also found is that the same is true for people that live in China today. The same is true for people that live in Papua New Guinea or in Australia. And the same is true for the people that live in North and South America, so Indi in indigenous people. So really, all people outside Africa have about 2% Neanderthal DNA. And that was a big kind of discovery because Neanderthals did not live in Asia, they did not live in Australia, they did not live in America. So how is it possible that all people outside Africa have Neanderthal DNA, even though Neanderthals were not present everywhere? Um, and we think that the best explanation still is that the common ancestors, so the population that left Africa 50,000 years ago, encountered Neanderthals on their way out of Africa. So somewhere in the Near East, those populations met and mixed, had offspring with each other, so in a ratio basically 1 to 20, um, and then basically went on to go to Europe, Asia, Australia, and the Americas and bring basically this Neanderthal ancestry into the world. Meanwhile, we also know that this was not the only time that Neanderthals and humans had babies with each other. We in fact also know that in Europe this also happened, but more than 40,000 years ago, 
the early people that came to Europe about 45,000 years ago, they had offspring with Neanderthals. However, they went extinct again, which is also interesting. So the first modern humans that came to Europe about 45,000 years ago, they did not leave descendants. So there was basically an attempt to come to Europe, but that was not successful. So the first humans um, vanished, but they had up to 12% Neanderthal DNA. So there was indeed more admixture in Europe, but unfortunately those people then uh, passed away. But the people that live in the world today, they basically all go back to this common ancestor that about 46 to 47,000 years ago met Neanderthals, probably in the Middle East, and had babies with them, and then carried this DNA all over the world. The same question then we, of course, wanted to ask also for Denisovans. What about Denisovans? Have, do Denisovans have babies with modern humans? Do we have people today in the world that maybe share more ancestry with those Denisovans, so with those East Asian or Southeast Asian hominids? And to our surprise, we found a quite different pattern. So again, in Africa, we don't have any Neanderthal or Denisovan DNA. But in Europe, we also don't have that. So there's no Denisovans in the past in Europe. And yeah, there was also no babies with Denisovans in Europe. In East Asia, so people that live in China today, it was different. There we actually find about 0.2%. That's not a lot. But there's actually some really interesting genes that modern Chinese people or people in East Asia inherited from Denisovans. And one of the genes, which is in fact now fixed in Tibet, in Sherpa, 100% of all Sherpa have that gene, is actually the gene that allows the adaptation to high altitudes. As you might know, Sherpa can easily kind of live on 4,000, 5,000 meter high altitudes. Um, and they have a gene that basically switches off one of the natural adaptation mechanisms that all of us have. So when we go to the, for example, Mount Everest, and we spend weeks in the base camp, and then we even climb Mount Everest. What happens in our blood is that we produce more erythrocytes, more red blood cells. We produce just more of them to basically kind of take more oxygen in. But that's actually not a good adaptation on the long run. For the short term, this is good. For the long run, you actually have all kind of medical conditions with this high amount of erythrocytes in your blood. And Sherpa basically have that switched off. And we know the mechanism, we know the molecular mechanism, and surprisingly, the gene that gives that molecular mechanism comes from Denisovans. So Denisovans had that. Denisovans are actually found also in some caves that are more than 3,000 meters high, also close to Tibet. So they probably already lived in high altitudes more than 40,000 years ago, and then passed on the gene to East Asians. The biggest surprise, however, about Denisovan DNA was that the people that live in Southeast Asia today, so for example, in the Philippines, or in Papua New Guinea, or in Australia, they have more than 5% of Denisovan DNA. There's actually a population in the northern part of the Philippines, the Aita, they have about 10% of Denisovan DNA. So they have 5% or 2, 2 to 5% of Neanderthal DNA, and then plus that they have um, then uh, about 10% of Denisovan DNA and also Papua New Guinean Highlanders, as well as the Aborigines that live in Australia, they have about 5% Denisovan DNA. So there's some populations in the world that have actually kept some of the Denisovan ancestry to a larger extent, probably telling us that Denisovans lived in this part of the world in the past. This is also why a lot of us now think that hobbits or Homo floresiensis might have been Denisovans because they live actually in this part of the world. And uh, other researchers have also shown that there are five admixture events. So five times we can say that Denisovans had babies with modern humans because there's different types of Denisovan DNA in different populations in Southeast Asia. And this is actually quite different Denisovan DNA. So the southern Denisovans are about 250,000 years diverged from the northern Denisovans. So that's almost like they're so different. You could, uh, again, almost call them then some different forms of human, the southern ones and the northern ones. But there have been many more events, like um, uh, this admixture event that we have with Neanderthals and modern humans. But <laughs> Svante and his team that has been really pushing this type of work um, uh, over the last uh, 30 years almost now, have actually not just done that to figure out who had sex with whom, right? So this was not the main motivation to actually find out how much percent Neanderthal DNA you find in different humans. The main motivation they actually had was to use those ancient human genomes to find out what makes humans humans 
to see what are the genetic differences that are special in us. And we are special. If you look at all the humans that lived over the last couple of million years, no other human has managed to venture into the world in 10,000 years, go to the remote tiniest island in the Pacific, increase the population size from a few thousand to eight billion, um, develop technology and art and all kind of modernness that we have in modern humans and that other, what we call archaic humans, such as Neanderthals or Denisovans, did not have. And that was actually what really drove him to do this type of research. So now that we have the DNA of those archaic humans, we can then compare the DNA of those archaics, like Neanderthals or Denisovans, to the DNA of chimpanzees, our closest living relative, and the DNA of people that live in the world today. And with this type of comparison, we can then identify positions where we compare the DNA, where, for example, Neanderthals and Denisovans look like a chimpanzee, for example, this position here, chimpanzee has a C, Neanderthals and Denisovans have a C, but all humans in the world today have a T at that position in the genome. So those are changes in our DNA that happened after we separated from the Neanderthals. So things that happened in the last, whatever, 400, 500,000 years. And those are, of course, truly the positions that make humans humans. Those are the things that changed on our lineage. And this is basically what those genomes of Neanderthals and Denisovans have provided to us now. And we now have this catalog, and it's a surprisingly small number. There's only about 30,000 positions in the genome that are fixed different, so where all people in the world today are different from Neanderthals. And there's only about, at least when the first genome was published, 100 amino acids. So 100 positions in proteins, so in genes, where Neanderthals and humans are fixed different. So it's a really small number of things that have ch changed basically on our lineage. And I said that that changed uh, maybe a bit from the first publication because the first publication of the first high coverage Neanderthal genome was in 2014. But meanwhile, we have millions of genomes from people that live in the world today. And we can actually see that a lot of like Neanderthal mixture happened, of course, in a lot of places. And actually, there's a lot of genes that have survived from Neanderthals, which makes it not any more a fixed difference because there's some people that basically carry those archaic genes in the world. And currently, there's only 17 amino acids that are different, that are fixed different, that are not found in anyone in the world today, but are basically a fixed difference to modern humans. So it's a really small number. And what, in fact, Svante and his team are currently doing is trying to figure out for each of those 17 kind of positions, what do they actually do functionally? Do they have an impact? Do they cause more kind of brain growth? They grow little organoids and petri dishes, which are like mini brains, and basically see how those mini brains that are in the Neanderthal state are different to the ones that are in the modern human state and so forth. So it's really like on the molecular level, trying to understand what makes us different. And this is then also what probably many of you know, um, he got awarded the Nobel Prize for last year for medicine. Um, for myself, I branched a bit away 10 years ago from the Neanderthal studies, and I actually started a new field of research that we now call ancient pathogen genomics. So I didn't focus so much on the DNA of people, but actually of the DNA of pathogens that live in people and might have killed people in the past. So uh, together with a few researchers here, which are group leaders and a former PhD student of mine, we have done a lot of work on what we call ancient pathogen genomes. So we reconstruct the genomes of pathogens from the past to tell something about the evolution of those pathogens. So not just human evolution, but also the evolution of, for example, Yersinia pestis, so the causative agent of plague. But we also looked at leprosy through time, syphilis, tuberculosis, Salmonella enterica, calling it typhoid fever, which we could show was actually introduced into the new world and caused massive pandemics. As well as I was very lucky to also work with this gentleman here, um, which is the famous Iceman, that had in fact a frozen stomach. And from the frozen stomach, we could um, reconstruct Heliobacter pylori, which lives in the stomach of people, um, and that we could actually reconstruct from thousands of years ago and then see how it evolved through time. So this was a new field of research and we're doing a lot of work in that direction. But the other field that I then started some years ago with a few other colleagues was what we now call archaeogenetics. And this was really just made possible because during my PhD, we developed a technique that allows us to distinguish between the DNA from the past and the DNA from a present. 
Why is that important? Because if you take a bone from the past and you touch that bone, you leave more DNA on that bone than is in that bone, right? So you contaminate the sample. If I then extract DNA from that ancient bone, how can I say that that is the DNA of that bone and not of the archaeologist or the lab person or someone that came in contact with that bone? And that has been a very big problem. Since the very early days, people have discussed how can we actually make sure that the DNA that we study from those bones really comes from those bones. For Neanderthals, this is not difficult because they're different from us. But for every modern human, any early modern human that is thousands or ten thousands of years old, we couldn't really do that. And I had actually shown that there is a way to do it, and that is by studying what we call DNA damage. So the DNA gets old, and while it gets older, it changes in its structure. So some basically positions change. C's become T's, in fact. It's a kind of, simil, uh, kind of simple thing. Uh, and we can look at those damage patterns. If they're there, the DNA is old. If they're not there, the DNA is young. And that was basically a very important technique because that then really allowed us to study then the DNA from the past and we could really show that this is DNA that is not from the present but actually DNA that has to be older than a few hundred years. And that really then started this new field. But that field also, of course, needs the DNA of modern people. And that's a field we call population genetics where people just look at the genetic differences between people that live in the world today. And there was a very influential paper um, that was almost yeah, 15 years now, so it's quite old, and that was very influential on many of us that study DNA from people that live today. What John and his group were doing at the time is they worked together with a hospital in Switzerland, and from that hospital they got 3,000 patients who said, I'm happy to participate in your genome study. And they also were required to have their parents coming from the same region, and their grandparents as well. So they had to say, I'm from this region, and my ancestors are also from that region. And then they participated in this genome study. And what this group then did is they analyzed the genome of those people and then compared the genomes to each other and see how they are similar or how they are different. Now, a genome, of course, is a huge data set. In the extreme case, it has three billion positions. They didn't look at every position, just at variable positions, so at a few million. But it's still a million times a few thousand people, so it's a very, very complex data set. And to bring this data set down in the major variation you have within that data set, you use something that we call a principal component analysis, where you basically break the variation down into two dimensions. And our brain works well with two dimensions, for some people, also three dimensions work. Four certainly do not work. So the more dimensions is more difficult, but two work well. And what you see here are the two major, basically, then variation dimensions in that data set. So what it basically means is each dot is a person. And when two dots are close to each other, it means their genomes look very similar. And if they're far away from each other, it just means they're not, right? They're kind of further away genetically. And what they did after they measured basically the genetic distance between the people, they then colored the people by where their ancestors were supposed to come from. So everyone who said, my ancestors come from Spain, got this dark blue color here. Everyone who said, my ancestors are from Portugal, got purple. Everybody who said, my ancestors are from France, they became yellow, Switzerland, France, Ireland, Great Britain, Scotland, Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, it's kind of hard to see, I can see, but <laughs> um, then uh, Austria, Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, here's Italy. What that actually is, in fact, is the map of Europe, right? Um, this is Iberia, this is the British Isles, this is Scandinavia, this is the Italian peninsula. Here's the Adriatic Sea. Here's the Mediterranean Sea. Here's the North Sea and the Atlantic. And that is written into the genes of the people that were basically present in that hospital in Switzerland, right? But it's also written into all your genomes. It's basically where your ancestors lived and reproduced over generations. There are now companies where you can send your DNA and they send you back your 
genetic kind of ancestry comes from this place and that place, which sometimes is exciting. For me, it's super boring. <laughs> uh, I'm, that company tells me that I'm 99.9% .9 Central European, and in fact, um, that my ancestry comes from the border region between Thuringia and Hesse, yeah, so in Central Germany. And indeed, three out of four grandparents come from the border region of Hesse and Thuringia. So it's so precise now, it's incredible. I have also friends, one is Ashkenazi, and so 99.9% .9 you're Ashkenazi, right? It's, it's really incredible how uh, those uh, ancestry tests now work. So they're really doing, I think, a good job, but also because they have large data sets. And this basically reflects geography, and this is something we see all over the world, that more or less the genetic structure that we see today reflects geography, and it also makes sense. So if you have people that live close by, you have a higher chance to have children with them than if someone lives far away. So therefore, people that live close by are genetically more similar, and people that live far away are not so similar. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. But it's also becoming clear that there's a gradient, right? You don't really see, I mean, you have the Netherlands here, but you can't really say, oh, there's the border to Germany, right? And this is the border to Belgium, and this is the border to England. But in fact, there's this kind of gradient that overlaps, right? Because people, of course, admixed and were mobile through time. And what we have been also then interested over the last couple of years is, how old is that structure? Is that thousands of years old because my ancestors always lived in that valley or in that village? Or is that actually something that is just 100 years old, 500 years old, 1,000 years old, 10,000 years old? How old is that structure? And did it change through time? Do we actually see major kind of shifts in that type of ancestry pattern? And that's basically what we do in archaeogenetics. We basically look at the genetic structure through time. And if we see big changes, like for example, we see this cluster, which we find in Iberia now, being 200 years ago in Scandinavia, it might tell us, oh, people moved. The Goth moved from Sweden to Visigoth in uh, Iberia, or not, right? Or is it all stable? And this is basically what we have been up to for, for the last 10 years or so. And there's, of course, many, many, many stories to be told for many places in the world. But again, I want to focus on Central Europe because there we have the most data and probably also something that you can uh, relate to most because you have probably also some more knowledge about this part of the world than other parts of the world. Roughly, we can basically talk about cultural ages that human history falls in, which is things like Stone Age, the Lithic Ages, the Mesolithic, Neolithic, the Metal Ages like Bronze Age, Iron Age, and then Antiquity, Medieval Time, and Modernity. You could also talk about geological e epochs like the Pleistocene, so the Ice Age, the Holocene, the last 10,000 years, the warm time after the Pleistocene that we're currently experiencing to end, but not into an ice age like it should, but in fact into the Anthropocene, which you see every day on the news because climate is warming. So we have stopped the ice age probably for quite a while, probably for millions of years because of uh, the fossil fuels that we have burned over the last 100 years or so. Um, but most of that human history, of course, is in what we call prehistory. It's before historical documents. We don't really have any writings from 10,000 years ago where people said, oh, we were living as hunter-gatherers in that kind of region and we're doing X, Y, Z. And um, that's really a shame because there are really interesting episodes in human history that happened in the past that we have no historical documents about we would really like to understand better. And the one thing that really was striking and was really interesting to a lot of people was something that we call the Neolithic Revolution. So this is a time period, depending where you are in the world, somewhere between 10,000 years and about 4,000 years ago. Here in Central Europe, it's about 7,500 years ago, so in this region here also, where people start from being hunter-gatherers, so foragers, to become farmers. They settle down, they have domestic animals, they have domestic plants, uh, and they change their lifestyle like never before. So for millions of years, we have been foragers, and suddenly we become agriculturalists, we settle down. So what happened? Why did we do that? And that's a question that we had for a very long time that we sometimes call the question pots or people. So was it just that ideas were spreading so that culture changed? Or was it that actually people came, that there was someone coming here bringing this in and that there was new people basically bringing and having this type of technology? And to do that, we have been now studying thousands of genomes in many different places in the world. There's just an overview of the about 15,000 skeletons that just in our lab, just in my lab in Leipzig, we have been studying over the last six, seven years or so from more than 2,000 archaeological sites from all over the world. But this now allows us to really look through those kind of 
historical or prehistorical events and see if anything changed through time. So we can really do time travel, basically, like I said at the beginning, based on this kind of genetic structure. So we start with this map again. So the similar map that you've seen before, but now it's not Europe kind of in this, but more tilted to the left. In fact, this is Iberia here. This is Western Europe. This is Northern Europe, Eastern Europe, Southeastern Europe. Here's the island of Sardinia. This is the Balkan. This is Anatolia, the Caucasus. If you want, here's the Black Sea. Here's the Adriatic Sea. Here's the Mediterranean. This is the Levant, uh, so the Eastern Mediterranean. So it's not exactly like Europe looks, but a bit tilted to the left. But for this kind of genetic time travel now, I will just take the modern people and just gray them out. So just keep them in mind there in the background. This is the modern people. And now we can do this time travel and we start our basically time travel then about 8,000 years ago in Europe, in Central Europe, Middle Europe, Eastern Europe, um, and look at the hunter-gatherers. So this is how they compare to the people that live in Europe today. So those are all hunter-gatherers that we have analyzed by now. So from more than 8,000 years ago, some are 20, some are 30,000 years old. And you can see those are the Western ones, those are the Baltic ones, the Scandinavian ones, those are the Eastern ones. Just trying to see, I kind of see it, but probably cannot read it so well. So what becomes very clear is that hunter-gatherers are different from the people that live in Europe today. So it's not the same people. So we cannot say hunter-gatherers are the people that live in Europe today, so there must have been something happening. And in fact, when we look 8,000 years ago um, in Anatolia and into the Middle East, the people are genetically quite distinct from the Europeans, and those people are already farmers, because farming is about 2,000 years older in this part of the world than in Europe. So it seems to have started there. And genetically, those early farmers from Anatolia are also quite different to the hunter-gatherers that live in Europe. And now we can start our time travel. We go from 8,000 years ago to 7,500 years ago. Then here in this region, you have something that's called the linear band ceramic. So you have a new culture. And then we can look, how does that genetic culture look like? How do those first farmers look like that lived here, for example, in the southern part of the Netherlands um, about seven and a half thousand years ago? Do they look like the hunter-gatherers that lived here, like on Doggerland? You've seen that image early on. We have a lot of genetic data from the Doggerland. They would fall here with the Western hunter-gatherers. Do they look like the Doggerland people 8,000 years ago? Or do they look different? And if you look at them, they actually look like that. Those are the early European farmers. They just look like Anatolians. They look like Anatolians 500 years earlier, which shows us very clearly that the early farmers that had farming here seven and a half thousand years ago had just migrated from Anatolia to Europe, bringing basically agriculture and domestic animals here. Because they're not looking at all like hunter-gatherers. So there is 99% genetic makeup is Anatolian. We cannot detect, basically, hunter-gatherer ancestry in those early farmers. They just look like they just came from Anatolia. And it's a massive genetic sh shift, right? 99% genetic shift. To get that today, you need 100 billion people coming here or something like that, right? This is, like, it's massive. It's really a big genetic shift. If you then move on in time, 6,500 years ago to 5,000 years ago, this is how all of Europe looks like in what we call the Copper Age. And you can actually see that there is a genetic shift. So from here to there, they are moving in this direction of the hunter-gatherers on this kind of PCA. And in fact, indeed, in the genomes of those people, we suddenly have chunks of hunter-gatherers, meaning that hunter-gatherers are not extinct. They still live here. People come from Anatolia, bring farming, and they mix, have babies, and that becomes basically a hybrid population. And that's also, for example, the Iceman, Ötzi, he is one of those. He is basically a hybrid between those two populations. He has a little bit of hunter-gatherer DNA, mostly, though, Anatolian farmer ancestry. And this is how Sweden looks, how Britain looks, how France, Germany, Spain, everything. All of Europe looks like, like what you see down here, but not like Europe looks like today. What's also interesting is, you have probably missed that, but there is a population which is just below here. There's actually some gray dots. There's some people still in Europe today that look like that, that look like the Iceman. Would you know where they are? Sardinia, exactly. So Sardinians, in fact, have preserved that genetic makeup. In fact, when the Iceman was first analyzed, the first genome of the Iceman came out 10 years ago, they re it resembled mostly modern-day Sardinians, and then some people even said that he was some sort of lost tourist, right, from Sardinia in the Alps, right? Um, Stone Age tourism or something like that. I think the Bildzeitung had something like that. 
Um, but it was not that, that, that he came from Sardinia. It's just that all Sardinians today look like the Copper Age people from Sweden, Great Britain, from everywhere. They all look like that. But it's also clear, again, this is different to modern Europeans, so something must still happen. And in fact, if we move not now to Central Europe, but now we look into Eastern, far Eastern Europe, north of the Black Sea, north of the Caspian Sea, we have a different population. So the Eastern Europeans are actually looking quite different at that time than Western Europeans. It's almost amazing to us to understand why these populations that are next to each other are genetically very distinct. They're as distinct almost as Europeans and East Asians today. So they're really kind of two very different genetic makeups in this time about 5,000 years ago. And this is how this population looks like that lives north of the Black Sea. They have a different history. Their farming didn't come from Anatolia. Their farming came from Iran because this is Iranian uh, farmers here. And they mixed with hunter-gatherers of, of, of those part of um, Europe. And you can already probably imagine what happens. This is how everything looks 5,000 years ago. Now we go from 5,000 years ago to 4,800 years, only 200 years into the future. And then something massive happens because then Europe looks like that. You suddenly have this big green blob here and you have basically a genetic mixture of what was Europe before and Eastern Europe because there seems to be a massive migration of people from the East into the West. We have actually some individuals here that are from, from uh, Germany, for example, from Czech Republic, from Switzerland, that are what we call corded wear or in kind of... Uh, further than uh, west, it's called uh, bell beakers. Those individuals, some of them look 100% like the people that lived in Eastern Europe before. So this population was basically the Iceman gets almost completely replaced by these newcomers that came from the east. They came from north of the, the Black Sea from the so-called Pontic Steppe. They have a different way of living. They're farmers, but they're more mobile. They're more mobile uh, farming um, as well as um, herding. So they have cattle, they have sheep, they have wheels and wagons. They speak Indo-European languages, we think, but I will come to that a bit later. And they seem to replace everyone um, to a larger extent in Central Europe. So it's again a massive genetic shift of this population. So that basically gives this kind of three ancestral components of Europe that we find in all people that live in Europe today. So we have the hunter-gatherers, we have those farmers from Anatolia, and then we have this Eastern European population that seems to move in about 4,800 years ago. So basically, short summary here, we have first those farmers coming in, mixing with the hunter-gatherers, starting about eight to 7,000 years ago. And then we have about 5,000 years ago, those Eastern Europeans mixing with this uh, Copper Age population to then give basically the genetic makeup that we see in Europe today. So by 4,800 years ago, basically the genetic history is kind of told. There's a lot of shifts and changes, but the major components are here in the Bronze Age. And this is just kind of a summary of all those Bronze Age cultures. And this is something that you can actually also then quantify in populations in the past. So this is another way to look at this, what we call it mixture, so we can look at those ancestral components. So what we see is in the early days, we have a lot of farming ancestry, then this blue comes back, which is this indigenous European ancestry, so the hunter-gatherers mixed with the farmers. Then about 4,800 years ago, you have this massive migration coming from the east. So you seem to have a lot of people coming in, bringing this green component, which is kind of associated here with the so-called Yamnaya, which is this kind of just culture, how this is called, uh, north of the Black Sea at that time period. And this is then also present in all people that live in then uh, Europe today. So some people like in Norway, for example, people have more of that green component. And then Sardinians here have very little of green and blue, but mostly have those early farmer component. As I mentioned before, they haven't really genetically changed so much. So you basically have this kind of summary here. You have this kind of early migration of people that started 8,000 years ago, so from the Fertile Crescent, where um, farming evolved. People come into Europe, spread all over Europe, bring farming to Europe, and with that, new genes. Then over the next 2,000 years, the hunter-gatherers mix with those incomers from Anatolia, and you have this mixed population like we find in the Iceman. And then about 4,800 years ago, you have this expansion of this Eastern European population into the West. And this really, this second migration, is actually the one that gave us the most trouble to understand over the last six, seven years. Why is that? Because understanding this is easy. Farming means more children. It's just demography. You have more children, that population expands. If you have 10 children and you have one farm, 
not all 10 will work on that farm. They probably go upstream and found a new farm and find someone to kind of start that farm with. So farmers just expand. And I think that's something we have seen all over the world. And it's even giving rise to the 8 billion people we have on the planet today because we're all children of farmers. I'm sure you are. If not, please talk to me. I want to talk to actually children of hunter-gatherers. Um, but most of us are children of farmers, or at least in some kind of generations um, past. So farming is easy to understand, but what happens here? How do those more or less farmers from the east replace the more or less farmers from here in the west? Why do they get completely replaced? And there's a lot of theories why that happened. A hundred years ago, people talked about the Aryans coming from the north. They were supposed to come from Scandinavia. Um, some people uh, talked about um, yeah, kind of warfare, and uh, in Germany, this culture in the 1920s and 30s was actually called the Battle X culture. Now we call it corded ware, so nice ceramics, but before we kind of more said about the, the weapons they were carrying. In, Nor in Norway and Sweden, they're still called the Battle X culture. So um, this culture seems to have a certain component with warfare, but in archaeology we don't find mass graves of people getting killed, so it's not that we really see genocide or something at the time. But what we do see is that we have seven times more men moving than women. So this is largely a male migration. So it seems to be mostly male herders coming from the east, moving west. When they come to Great Britain at that time, they replace the Y chromosome of the British people within 100 years. All the Y chromosomes are gone. Same happens in Iberia. Within 150 years, all Y chromosomes of uh, Iberia are gone. How they do that, we do not know. Maybe they're just really attractive, tall, large people. We really don't know. There's a lot of speculation what's happening. And one thing that we could contribute to this discussion, as well as some of our colleagues, was that we actually looked for pathogens. Maybe pathogens are part of the story. And indeed, when we looked at pathogens at that time, we actually could find a kind of well-known pathogen that we had been studying for many years in medieval times, so Yersinia pestis, the cause of agent of plague, but actually, we found it already in the Stone Age. So Yersinia pestis was already around. So there was plague at the time. It was actually the first time plague entered Europe about 5,000 years ago. Could be coincidence. Could also be maybe part of the story. Maybe the people coming in, they were culturally or biologically adapted to this type of plague. We are, again, not quite sure what happened. But anyway, um, this is something that we found. We looked a bit more into this plague from the past. We could then build family trees of plague. And don't want to bore you too much about ancient pathogens. Um, but uh, what we could certainly say is that there was this plague that was introduced from the east into the west, and uh, it actually even spread back in time. So um, it could be that somehow this population that expanded brought the plague here and then maybe uh, have contributed to the demise of that population. But then again, it wouldn't be really clear why it was mostly killing men and not f f women. But then some people said maybe it's because of horses. I mean, there's all kind of uh, hypothesis there, but at the end, we don't really know um, why that happened. But that seems to be related. So the people that move at that time bring the plague uh, east and west. What's interesting about that Stone Age plague is, if you look at the genome, there's actually a big chunk missing. So when we compare modern Yersinia pestis and that ancient Yersinia pestis, there is part of the genome is not there in the past, and it's actually not any part. There are actually the genes missing that cause bubonic plague. So bubonic plague is transmitted by fleas, and the genes necessary for that type of transmission are not present in the ancient genome. So it could not cause bubonic plague, so it was probably septicemic for sure, it came some on the blood, it has killed the people. It was probably what we call pneumonic plague, so probably transmitted by droplet infection between people. So a bit like corona, maybe, but again, that's speculation. And we also have now one genome um, from the past, from about 3,800 years ago, that is actually different. In the phylogeny, in the family history here, it falls with modern Yersinia pestis and not this branch here, which is the ancient uh, Stone Age plague. So this is actually an ancestor of modern-day uh, Yersinia pestis. And if you look into the genome, it actually does have those genes necessary for bubonic plague. So that was bubonic plague. So bubonic plague started around 4,000 years ago, 1,000 years after this uh, Stone Age plague. So first there was Stone Age plague, again, probably transmitted between people by droplet infection. And then bubonic plague evolved about 4,000 years ago. But then 1,000 years after this big thing happened. So probably it's not related. What we can also, of course, do, and this is really at the end now, we cannot just 
study then the DNA of the people for looking at ancestry and who had sex with whom, but we can also look at phenotypes. And this is, of course, something what the DNA codes for, right? It's the blueprint that tells the kind of cells what to do. And there are different genes that are known that are associated to phenotypes. So for example, there's a gene that's called HEROC2 or OCA2, which is known to cause light eyes, so blue eyes, light green eyes. And that has a very high frequency today in Central Europe, like in this region here, the frequency today is about 70% or so. 70% of the people carry that gene. It is, however, recessive, so if you have a brown eye color gene and a blue eye color gene, you have still brown eyes, right? Which also means if you have brown eyes and your parents have blue eyes, maybe you should talk to one of those human geneticists in the room, <laughs> or to your parents. <laughs> Um, so that's not possible. Um, hopefully, <laughs> someone is now angry taking their phone out. Um, but it's, it's a gene that we can now then, of course, also track through time. So again, it's in high frequency today. If you go back in time, it's the red line here. We can actually find that in the early farmers, the frequency is about 20%. So probably they almost all had brown eyes. So those people coming from Anatolia had brown eyes. Maybe to a lot of people, not a big surprise. If we go, however, further back in time to the indigenous Europeans, the hunter-gatherers that lived here about eight, 9,000 years ago, like the ones from, from the Doggerland, for example, um, the frequency is, in fact, 100% of the blue eyes. So they all had blue eyes. All hunter-gatherers that we have analyzed, which is now 350 hunter-gatherers, about 60 or 70 from the Netherlands, they all had blue eyes. So blue eye was really the kind of phenotype of the hunter-gatherers that lived in Europe about eight to 10,000 years ago. If you go further back in time to 20,000 years, they all have brown eyes. So blue eyes emerge about 15,000 years ago, and then they spread like wildfire. For whatever reason, blue eyes are super at that time. It's not really clear what, what is the selection advantage. We probably think it's sexual selection. It's just more attractive because there's no biological explanation otherwise. Um, but they are still spreading today. There's actually the UK Biobank study could actually show that even in the 20th century, blue-eyed people in Great Britain have more children than brown-eyed people. Right? which could also have all kind of social explanations. It doesn't have to be biology and doesn't have to be sexual selection, but it's still an interesting phenomenon. But there's also this other phenotype that Europeans are so famous for, and that is the, the, the skin color, right? That we are sometimes called whites, right? So people that have light skin. And there's a number of genes involved, but there are two genes that are fixed in Central Europeans today. So the, the uh, blue line here and the green line. So they're really like everyone basically of Central European ancestry has them. If you go back to the early farmers, you can actually see the frequency is low. So the people coming from Anatolia, they seem to have had more browner skin or kind of darker skin, more pigmentation than the people that live in Europe today. If we now go further back in time, however, the frequency, in fact, in Western hunter-gatherers is zero of those light uh, skin genes. So we haven't found yet Western Europeans or the guys with the blue eyes that has light skin. They all have dark skin. In fact, they have dark skin that we can currently genetically not distinguish from the people in sub-Saharan Africa. So it's really a different phenotype than a lot of people think about early Europeans, right? We don't, if you go to the museum and you look at Comagnon people or any kind of people, hunter-gatherers that lived 10,000 years ago, they are always having white skin. But it's not at all how they look like. They probably more look like this phenotype that you see here on the, on the lower left, um, so dark skin and blue eyes. Um, and that was also interesting because we looked at this gentleman here, uh, we just published that a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Iceman, that has been reconstructed like that by the Kenneth brothers, right? They unfortunately didn't have the genome data. Now that we have the genome data, it looks actually quite different because, yeah, he had dark skin because he was a very early farmer, so darker skin than Europeans today. He had also dark eyes, whereas the early reconstruction had blue eyes. But what he also had was he had actually a gene that causes bold, boldness. So it's male pattern boldness, which is kind of onset about 40 to 50 years. He was about 50 years old. So he probably looked more like that. So uh, actually quite different to the Kenneth brothers. And so also when you go to the museum and people think about Etsy, they always think about that left guy. They would never think about kind of how the right guy looks like. But then you've seen earlier the picture of the mummy. The mummy actually looks like that. It is dark and has no, no hair. So it's probably much more likely that he looked like this than the left um, uh, reconstruction. So we should really look at the mummy and not the reconstruction. And then very last, of course, with people also move languages. And now, of course, we don't know what those skeletons were talking when they were living, but we can correlate. We can correlate the genetic spread to so the spread of different clusters, as you've seen, 
and how kind of what languages are spoken in different parts of the world today. And for this language group that is mostly spoken, dominantly spoken in Europe today, which I'm also speaking now, which you're also speaking, otherwise you can't understand me, but also Dutch and German, all kind of languages are part of it, is the Indo-European language family, largest language family in the world, kind of spreads from Iceland to India. And uh, there are two main hypotheses how those languages came to Europe. And one is the so-called Anatolian hypothesis, saying that early farmers brought that language when they spread farming here, and the other one is what we call the steppe hypothesis, which is people from the steppe about 5,000 years ago, when they came, they actually brought that language group. And now you could actually think, if you kind of think about what I just told you, there were two migrations in Europe, one from Anatolia and one from the steppe. So can we actually say anything? It seems that both hypotheses are supported because we have people coming from Anatolia 8,000 years ago and we have people from the steppe coming 5,000 years ago. So can we really distinguish between the two scenarios? But we can because they also would mean that because Indo-European languages are spoken in India, you should have both genetic ancestries in India. You should have the ancestry of Anatolian farmers and you should have that ancestry that is spoken here in the Yamnaya, basically north of the Caucasus. That should both be present in India, but in fact it's not. Those two are present in Europe, but the Anatolian ancestry is not found at all in India. But what is found in India is actually the steppe DNA. And we can even say when it arrived about 3,700 years ago. And the Vedic texts, which is only early Sanskrit, are about that age. So that even fits with the earliest texts that we have in India, which are Indo-European. So we have this really nice correlation. It's actually a beautiful correlation that works all over Eurasia with this steppe ancestry moving basically through time and space, and the correlation with what they speak today, which are Indo-European languages. So the step hypothesis is really st strongly supported by genetics, but the Anatolian hypothesis is not, which in itself is interesting because that means the Anatolians brought a different language family here, and then we have to ask the question, what language is that? What were Anatolians speaking? What were the early farmers speaking? What was the Iceman speaking, right? And we think the closest to what they're speaking is actually Basque. That's the only language that is still left, which is an early farmer language. The ancestry of the early Basque people is almost 100% Anatolian. So they're not hunter-gatherers. Some people have thought that in the past that there are some weird hunter-gatherer language or something. No, they are early farmers, and they have an early farmer language. Um, and there were other languages, like in Sardinia, people were speaking Paleozardo until about two and a half thousand years ago, until they were conquered by the Romans. The Etruscans were speaking a non-Indo-European language. The Minoans were speaking a non-Indo-European language. Genetically, all those populations are very, very high in Anatolian ancestry. So probably they were speaking Anatolian early farmer uh, language, and the only one that seems to be left is Basque, which also means if you want to construct the language family, you can actually combine Basque Paleozardo, Minoan, Etruscan, they should be the same language family like Indo-European. They are very deeply diverged, 8,000 years, but still, um, if some linguists are here, you should maybe work on that a bit more. I know other people have tried, but uh, it could be quite interesting. So then, in summary, um, what can we say? Neolithic revolution um, is a diffusion of people and ideas, certainly. We have both. We have people spreading. We have also then this new um, technologies that are coming with them. Uh, we have also new genes, we have new phenotypes, as you've seen, that are spreading, and also diseases that are spreading. So we can say, first of all, all Europeans today come from at least three original populations. I haven't talked about the people far up north. They have yet a different ancestry. So the Sami, for example, they have also Siberian ancestry. Um, we have uh, the early farmers coming from Anatolia, which was, again, not known 10 years ago. We have uh, this immigration from the Pontic Steppe, which was the biggest surprise, probably, that genetics has revealed that this was this big migration from the east that some people in archaeology had seen and some people had expected, but a lot of people not to that extent. Uh, we have these two mass migrations, at least the second one we can certainly say is a mass migration. This is connection to the Indo-European languages of the second migration. And then again, then also plague, for example, was spreading during that time um, and might have been um, at least influencing the type of migration patterns. By that, I come to an end. I thank all the people that have given us money over the years, all the people that did the fantastic work and have just talked about it, like myself, so all my people in the lab. We see we're actually quite an international team. And if you are excited about that type of work, if you want to read more about it, there are two books uh, that I um, authored together with a good friend of mine, Thomas Trapper, um, that are both available also in Dutch. Um, and then there's also other 
kind of languages, so I think 24, so they're translated if you don't speak Dutch, but I think probably most of you do. So again, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take some questions, so thank you. And sorry for going over time. <laughs> All right, thank you, Johannes. That was really a wonderful lecture, and I actually couldn't think of a better way to have this special event for you. Um, I'm going to do some gift giving, especially so I don't forget. And just in case you thought that all the ordeals that Johannes bears for us are just a 12 hour travel with lots of canceled trains. He also has a young family. Am I correct that you're actually even on parental leave right now? Yeah. yeah. So Johannes is here, people, when he's on parental leave. And so, Woo! right? He has two young children at home. I remember those days too. So rather than bring bottles of alcohol and hopefully not disappointing Johannes by revealing that, I actually have a toy for uh, your young son and for your daughter. And I have nice chocolates in here, which you can also share with your wife. So that when she asks you, why do you go away on parental leave to give lectures far, far away? And you travel 12 hours, spend two hours in a room and travel back again as fast as you can. Hopefully, that's something for both of you to enjoy. Or otherwise, if train travel remains difficult, it's some food in the train to get you there. So, um, but as Johanna said, right, he's happy to take questions. Uh, we have Yap right there uh, with a microphone, so um, and I would make like, yourself known. Yeah, and I would like to suggest to end at, uh, well, let, let's say we have 50 minutes for questions. So um, please keep your question short and uh, <laughs> then we can do the questions, 50 minutes. Thanks. Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, during the lecture at one point you mentioned that uh, you can compare the DNA of uh, modern humans, how many underlenses, etc. And you can see all the uh, loci in the genome where there is a difference and you can count those and I think you said, uh, for example, we have, there are 30,000 different positions between modern human genomes and the other lenses, etc. Were you talking about the coding part of the genome, or like are there these 30,000 differences both in coding and non-coding? Yeah, so um, that is mostly in the non-coding part, so the non-genic regions. So within the genes, we only have about, like I said, 90, uh, which are basically non-synonymous changes where we have mutations that actually cause the amino acids to change to that the protein is actually different that the gene is coding for. So it's a very low number. And then again, one should say that those are the fixed differences. So where all modern humans today are different from the Neanderthals or chimpanzees. So that basically arose in those 200, 300,000 years. So it's really a fixed difference. Of course, if you look at the genome, like your genome, my genome, we probably have about 4 million differences. It doesn't mean that we're most more different than we are with Neanderthal because, of course, there's a shared genetic variation that we even share with chimpanzees and, and all kind of other people. But yeah, so if you just compare the Neanderthal genome and the modern human genome, you would probably have five, six, seven million differences. But the, sh the fixed differences between all people and Neanderthals are in that kind of order of 30,000 in the, in the non-coding part and about only 100 that are actually causing changes in the amino acids and therefore the proteins. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask you regarding uh, this uh, uh, group that you mentioned that you call it often uh, steppe people, Indo-Europeans, mm. Indo-Aryans, whatever. So these people uh, stem from an earlier group called ancient North Eurasians, right? No? Partially, partially. Um, so their genetic makeup itself is a mixture. They have a lot of what we call ancient North Eurasian ancestry, which is some sort of Siberian ancestry, which was first described in an individual that's 25,000 years old from called, site called Malta, which is close to Lake Baikal. So that's basically almost 100% of that type of ancestry. And that ancestry after the Ice Age, when basically the ice retreats, moves uh, to the west with hunter-gatherers. Um, and then this basically hunter-gatherers, which lived north of the Caucasus, eight to 10,000 years ago, have a lot of that genetic ancestry. 
But then you have farming also spreading in that region, and that actually comes from Iran over the Caucasus, and we actually see the process how that happens. We have some individuals in the Northern Caucasus 7,200 years that are still 100% hunter-gatherer, and then 200 years later, 7,000 years ago in the Maikop culture, for example, you have then 50% ancestry of hunter-gatherers, 50% of those Iranian uh, people coming in, probably also with the Indo-European languages. We actually think the Indo-European languages crossed the Caucasus at that time, so Proto-Indo-European was speak, spoken south of the Caucasus and then spreads into this population. But basically this, Ancestral North Eurasian ancestry is a very old one that is like 25,000 years ago, right? So this is related to this whole hunter-gatherer ancestry and how basically hunter-gatherers are related and basically are reoccupying also this area. What I found most striking there is that the hunter-gatherers sitting north of the Caucasus and, for example, sitting at Lake Onega, which is far up in Russia, is genetically almost indistinguishable at that time. So there's really this fast expansion. So it seems to be that this whole area, which is basically between the Ural and Scandinavia, is not really densely occupied, maybe not occupied at all at the end of the Ice Age. Probably it's too cold. Probably no one really lived there. And then this is basically where some of that ancestry flows in. Yeah. So the basic components are uh, ancient North Eurasians? And ancient Neolithic Iranian from the Kukuteni, Tripolian, and Maikop, and uh, all that? Yeah. No, that's yet the difference. So Tripolia culture is basically the culture that sits on the western shore of the Black Sea. So um, this is genetically Anatolian ancestry mostly. But the, what basically the genesis of the Yamnaya of that culture, the steppe culture, is indeed the hunter-gatherer component from that region, which has this high A and E ancestry. And then it's Neolithic from Iran. And those two together give that ancestry that then moves to the West, that then comes here with the corded wear, which we then say whatever, 70, 80% of that ancestry is found in corded wear or in bell beakers. So the Tripolia itself um, is basically 100% early farmer, or very close to 100% of early farmer. And in fact, when you then look at the uh, corded wear, I just said the corded wear is 70% Yamnaya, but it has 30% something else. It has 30% early farmer ancestry, and that is actually, um, what's that in English, Kugelamphore in, um, in uh, English. Anyone, Kugelamphore? Uh, sorry? Bellbeaker? No, no, Bellbeaker is something, like Kugelamphore. Anyone? kind of missing the, the name of the culture yet. But it's, it's basically the, the culture that sits at 5,000 years ago in Central and Eastern Europe, like in Poland, for example. Um, and, and this basic population, when they move from the west, uh, from the east into the west, so the Yamnaya, when they spread, they mix with this. And that also the Tripoli culture would also be part of that. So they mix to so this 30, 70% that mixture. Thank you very much. And Sorry, yeah. a <laughs> small question. Yeah. Uh, there is, uh, you mentioned in your 2021 book that the Anatolian farmers were of two strains and that they were quite distinct. Yes, indeed. When did they mix? mix? Yeah, they mixed between seven and 6,000 years ago that starts. So the Anatolian farmers that spread to Europe are genetically very different to the ones I just mentioned from Iran or basically the eastern part. The eastern part of Anatolia and the western part of Anatolia or the western part and the eastern part of the Fertile Crescent. The Fertile Crescent is a crescent, right? It's shown like that, like a bow. But genetically, they are very different. If you kind of can't really go back to the slide, don't even want to do that. But they were basically on the upper end was where this one group was, and on the lower end is where the Anatolian were. They were like basically East Asians and Europeans today. They were genetically very different, but they live in the Fertile Crescent. It's, it's still something that we have a hard time to understand, but we don't have the previous populations from that region. We don't even know how that, how that happened, how basically the people living in the Levant uh, 8,000, 9,000 years ago are so different from the people living in Iraq and Iran, which is just next door. But there's probably this desert there is probably a very strong geographic barrier for hunter-gatherers. So there was not a lot of exchange between the Eastern Mediterranean and the Zagreb, uh, sorry, the Zagre Zagros Mountains. So there was not a lot of people moving in that, in that region that probably caused this genetic, there was some sort of barrier for a very long time. Probably the Ice Age has caused something that they were very different. Yeah. Sorry, that was very detailed questions now, but I hope people could follow. Yeah. Um, yeah, the physicist Dirac once said that uh, new uh, theories uh, propagate in science not because scientists become convinced, but simply because old scientists die. <laughs> Suddenly, archaeologists have a new competitor. How does the archaeological community react to these new developments? 
No, it's a very good question. And I could kind of start that with how did the anthropologists react to the Neanderthal DNA, right? Because for them, that was also taking away their interpretation of looking at the skull, and there's a bump there, and there's no bump here, and therefore they're different, to, oh, there is 3.2% uh, ancestry here and there, like very quantitative data. And at the beginning, anthropologists were super unhappy because we're destroying the fossils, we're destroying world heritage, and it took a while, but by now I think most anthropologists are embracing genetics because that really kind of solves some of the puzzles that they have been like working with for, for a very long time. And the same happened in archaeology. When I first presented this type of wor work where we had this big migration from the Yamnaya into the West, I, I, it was incredible. I, was, I had an audience like that and people were almost screaming at me, right? Because I'm a Nazi basically, because I'm reviving the ideas of Nazi archeologists from the early 20th century where it was all about migration. But for the last 50 years in archeology, span we have shown it's all a construct. We deconstructed all those ancient movements. This was just ideas spreading. This was not people spreading and you were just this, some sort of kind of yeah, revived kind of like Nazi zombie or something like that. But uh, I mean, this is quantitative data. We can do very little about it, right? I mean, that the ideas that people had 100 years ago were not all wrong. It's just the case. They looked at the material culture and they found similarities. And if you look at the similarities between Yamnaya objects and corded ware objects, they are striking. You can have seen like a grave plate that was just, I, I saw that in, in my cop and I saw that in Halle in the museum and they were like, they were identical. It's like, how can you say that this was just an idea spreading? There must have been people basically kind of moving from here to there. And I think those ideas were there before. And yeah, I think this is a process we have gone through for the last eight years and I think we have actually come you know, to terms with each other and we're kind of doing a lot of work together because we also have to understand why you know, those constructs were at the end not constructs and also to show how you know, it's not all that material, so POTS is people. This is also not true. We have many cases where it's not POTS are people. We have cases in the, in the migration period where a person wears a Langobard outfit, but genetically he's Southern European, he looks like a Sicilian. And we have other cases like that, especially in later periods where it doesn't mean if you have certain cultural artifacts, you are that genetic cluster. And genetic clusters are genetic clusters, and archaeological cultures are archaeological cultures, and we should not say it's, it's the same. There are many cases where they're not the same, but in many cases they are. There's a good correlation, at least. There's a certain genetic makeup that comes with a certain type of culture. It's not a big surprise to me, but yeah, for archaeologists it was hard to accept. But now comes the next problem. So now we convinced the anthropologists. Now we, I think, did a pretty good job with archaeologists. But now we are moving into the historical time periods. And this is something I didn't even mention tonight. I talked about prehistory. But now we're working on the migration period. We're working with, like I just said, Langobards or Greeks or Romans or ancient Egyptians and things like that. And then you are kind of facing yet a completely different kind of field where people have a written evidence. They have what those people were saying. And of course, that's subjective, but still, they have, of course, different interests, and they're not interested in biological identity. They're just interested in kind of what the people maybe have felt or things like that. And, and it, that's also a very interesting debate uh, that we're having. So the, the book I showed at the end when I published it in Germany, one year later, there were two kind of famous German historians that wrote an entire book about my book, kind of showing how my book doesn't tell us anything. We have learned nothing. And, and they say that more than 80 times in their book that this best Sarah, they don't even give it the name of, they always call it the best Sarah has told us nothing, right? So they're very kind of strong in their words, and, but, but their definition of history is the written evidence. So we haven't learned anything in the face of written evidence, which means that, you know, 90% of the world doesn't have history because if you only say where written evidence is there, then it's very little. So it's very narrow-minded, and I think we are also going into a direction where we convince them Probably also it takes five to ten years. Hopefully not just cemeteries. Hopefully also kind of arguments. But I think we're getting there as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your lecture, and also thanks to Steam General and Dubois Foundation for remembering you here, who has also been my PhD mentor decades ago. Uh, my question is about epigenetics, a field I'm working on now. So you talk a lot about genetics, but nowadays people look a lot into epigenetics, so the regulation of gene activities. And uh, we know that these uh, marks on the DNA are quite stable, but not that stable. So I was wondering, have people looked at all into, is there any chance of extracting DNA methylation profiles or epigenetic uh, markers uh, from ancient samples? And if so, 
uh, would this give us any additional information on the, the human history in Europe? Thank you. Yes, so this is um, something that, I mean, it was actually a fellow PhD student of mine 15 years ago that showed that you can study epigenetics, so they basically produce the protocols that allow it. Um, and I mentioned before that there is this damage, that DNA gets damaged over time, which turns Cs into Ts. What actually happens is Cs get deaminated and they get actually turned into uracils. If they're methylated, however, they get directly turned into th Ts. So if you have uracils, you can actually use an enzyme that cuts out uracils, uracil declacosylase, that actually cuts away the uracil, and every C that still is a T that has changed is then a methylated one and everything else has been cut away. So everything that basically remains after this procedure is a methylated um, uh, C. So therefore, this is even a way how you can study it, but it has to be damaged. And that means only the damaged parts give you that signal, the undamaged parts don't, and damage happens mostly at the ends of the DNA, where the DNA is basically single-stranded or is breathing, and the middle part not. And therefore, it's a very weak signal um, but some of my colleagues have just put up a bioarchive paper like last week or two weeks ago where they now use very simple bisulfide treatment of ancient DNA. Works like a charm. So I think no one tried for 15 years because we were all not so interested in it. But now they did it and it actually works quite well and you can even do it on low coverage data. Um, and so just a question what you do with it. I, I mean, you're an expert on it, so probably you should maybe then do it and kind of look into it. Um, but what I think is very exciting, at least to me, where epigenetics could be very useful is for looking at uh, basically the epigenetic clock. So looking at how old was that person when it died, because often we have only a tiny bone, like from the Denisovan, the one that we discovered was actually a pinky finger, was the tip of a pinky finger, it was like cherry stone. That was all we had. So we have the genome, we have the epigenome of that individual, so we could potentially then say how old was that individual when it died, which would be super cool, or for, for other individuals. The Iceman, we can maybe roughly say how old it is, but it will still be interesting. So this, this uh, epigenetic clock, which ticks in all of us apparently, so if you don't know, so apparently your epigenetic signature changes while you live, and people can now even estimate how old you are by just looking at your epigenetic genome. And that goes like plus minus three years. So it seems to be pretty good if it's a well understood population uh, and a good reference uh, data set for that population. And of course, it would be cool to do that for the past because we often we don't know and that we could really do paleo demography. I mean, people always say people didn't get that old in the past, but actually we do not know. Because if you look at the skeleton, you can't actually say how old that person was. You can say it was younger than 50, but you can't say was it 60, 70, 80, 90, you can't really say that. We can say between zero and 25 pretty well, then between 25 and 50, and then older than 50, but that's all we can say in paleo. Um, uh, anthropology, so yeah, that would be really cool, so maybe people will do that in the future. We have five minutes left, so we, we try to do two questions. Please keep it very, very short. Um, you talk about uh, two uh, language uh, streams, yes, one from Aletonia and one from uh, the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. And, uh, well, my question is, in fact, is the, uh, the language in the, uh, from the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea related to, let's say, uh, languages as Dutch, German, English, and from the Anatolian uh, uh, stream related to France, Italian, uh, Spanish? Or is this really a stupid uh, way to see it? Yeah, so uh, the Indo-European language family itself, uh, people have basically traced back kind of with linguistic methods how closely they are and even how they change through time. Of course, some of it is known of French as Latin, right? We know this is like 2,000 years old when the Roman Empire expanded. Spanish is also Latin. Italian is Latin. So this is just goes back. And Rito Roman in, in Switzerland is also Latin. So they go back to a very recent history. Before that, people were speaking a Gaelic language in, in, in France. Um, and so it depends where you are. You have, of course, also within even historical times, some knowledge about kind of the different spreads. But the Roman languages, they are actually very young. They are basically going back to Roman time, right? So two and a half thousand years ago or something like that. Um, and then kind of the Germanic languages, they are closely related to Gaelic languages or in that kind of phylogeny, Romans are basically different to Gaelic German. They are a bit closer to each other. And then they're all branching off from the Balto-Slavic, which is yet a different one, and you have basically those different kind of groups that are 
similar kind of based on, on, on linguistic terms. But it all fits pretty well to this uh, spread of what we call this kind of uh, step ancestry. So um, that is something that happens 5,000 years ago. And you have these different streams of ancestry then basically sp uh, spreading in different parts. Um, and that basically gives rise to families that are then becoming the families that we know today. So I think Roman wasn't spoken uh, 4,000 years ago in, in Italy, but we have this steppe ancestry moving into Italy about 3,500 years ago. Etruscan is not an Indo-European language, receives that steppe ancestry, but only about 10%, so lower than later populations. So, uh, but uh, for example, Mycenaean and Minoan, we know Mycenaean is Indo-European, Minoan is not. So linear A, linear B, which is writing, one we can read, which is linear B, which actually is, is Greek, it's an early form of Greek, which is an Indo-European language, but then Minoan is not. We don't, cannot read it, it's an actually an enigma. It's like, you know, we can't decode it. So same letters, like My Mycenaean, which is Greek, but can't make, it's gibberish, we can't really make, because the language we just do not know. And there again, we see that about 4,200 years ago, the steppe ancestry moves into Peloponnese and then kind of spreads onto the islands from about 4,000 to about 3,800 years ago. And that's exactly when we have this linear A and linear B. So we see even this movement of that type of ancestry in the steppe ancestry, but then suddenly people kind of having, having a Mycenaean kind of language, uh, the, the basically a linear B type. Um, so that, again, correlates pretty well. But it's not that the Roman languages and the, the, the Germanic languages are the steppe ancestry and the Anatolian ancestry. That's all steppe ancestry, it seems. Like I said, the only Anatolian languages that still exist today, or the only one, is just Basque, we think. Basque is really the only one that is still left of that languages that were spoken in Europe four to 8,000 years ago. And the last question is for you, the person who came down from the Balkan. Um, could you expand on uh, uh, the archaeogenetics of Baltic people, so uh, the current uh, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia? Absolutely. I mean, it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, group genetically, um, linguistically as well. Baltic languages are close to the Slavic languages. They're kind of one language family almost. Some people say they're not. Some people say they are. I'm very careful because it's a mine field <laughs> if you go especially these days in this part of Europe. Um, but it's also an interesting region because, uh, I mean, there's many different stories and I could give a whole one hour lecture about the genetic, basically history of the Baltic um, region, which because it has all kind of interesting phenomena. It has a, has a very um, high proportion of this uh, hunter-gatherer ancestry, those early ancestry. Actually, Estonians have the highest in Europe. They have more than 50% early um, hunter-gatherer ancestry. Um, and then you see a similar phenomenon that we see also in other places. You have those early farmers coming in. Lithuanians have more early farmer ancestry than, again, Estonians have the highest amount of hunter-gatherer ancestry. A thousand years ago, there were still hunter-gatherers, like Finnish also. The farming spreads really late in this part of the Baltic. So Lithuania has farming early on. It takes 3,000 years before it actually spreads north, just because it's just yeah, very different. It's almost Scandinavia out there. Um, but what is interesting is that the, the genetic makeup of the southern Lithuanians that we have during the Bronze and Iron Age and the genetic makeup that we have in eastern Poland, so the border to Lithuania, and the genetic makeup we have in the west of Belarus, basically this border region between the three countries, that genetic makeup we suddenly see expanding massively about 700 years AD. So this genetic makeup changes the entire landscape of all of the eastern part of Europe, so from basically Germany to Italy to the Balkans to uh, all of Eastern European countries, and that basically seems to relate to Slavs. So Slavs are one of the strongest genetic, basically, movements, but then, you know, Baltic is not necessarily a Slavic language, you might say, right? Slavic language is, is a different group, but it seems to be that the origin, at least, of that genetic group that speaks Slavic languages today and in the past where we know it, for example, the Slavic settlement or something like that, um, is coming from that region. So, um, and in fact, there are cultures then 800, 900 AD or so that are genetically more Slavic than, say, modern day Russians or something like that that speak Slavic. So it's, it's really an interesting region because it seems to be the home region of the Slavic genetic kind of ancestry that moves all over Europe. But to an extent where I explained to you this big migrations, 
where we have a hard time to even understand why it happens during that time, why it's so massive, why there's such a big genetic shift with a culture that does not come with a big empire like the Romans. That the Romans changed the genetic landscape makes a lot of sense, and I could again talk an hour about what the Romans did to Europe. It's massive, right? As you can imagine, this huge empire brings in a lot of people from the Near East. But uh, for, 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 for the Baltic states, again, it actually changed the genetic landscape of all of Eastern Europe starting in the 7th, 8th century, but not that you could kind of attribute that to a big empire. It's actually the Slavs, which themselves, the Slav, slave, is the same word, right? That's where that word is coming from. They were even often used as slaves uh, in, in, those, in those days between the 6th and 10th century uh, by other nations. There was a lot of slavery. Um, and um, yeah, but still they have massively shifted. And it could even be that slavery was the cause that just Avars and other kingdoms just got them as, as basically workforces. Uh, and th that's why th this kind of genetic cluster expanded so much. But it's present everywhere now, this type of Baltic ancestry. Again, correlating with Slavic, and there you see kind of with the languages, sometimes it's also tricky when you talk about that. Uh, but then again, some linguists say Baltic doesn't, you know, Baltic and Slavic say the same thing. It's basically the same language family. They're very, very close. I mean, they're probably 2,000 years and less diverged from each other. And they're in other language families. We don't talk about other families. They are very, very close languages also. So yeah, again, sorry for so many details. All right, thank you. <laughs> okay, so then, I guess, thank you. <laughs> So once again, my thanks to Johannes. A couple of quick announcements, 90 seconds, I hope to be done. We'll do it quick. Um, right, thanks to Johannes. Also, especially thanks to you for coming and attending this lecture. Uh, we've mentioned the uh, Dubois Foundation. We mentioned the Studium Generale program and thanks to Jaap and his colleagues too. I was reminded that there is another group that has not come over my lips yet, but it's the Faculty of Science and Engineering in the Maastricht Science Program too. That that helped organize this. Let's not forget them and thank them. And then lastly, uh, even though there is one Dubois lecture within the Studium Generale program a year, typically, there are more lectures from the Dubois Foundation in Eisden. So if you're not aware of that yet and you found this amazing as I found it amazing, uh, there are more lectures and try to find out more of the Dubois Foundation. Um, and once again, thank you for coming. And that was my 90 seconds. Good night.